morning as we uh, start our time in the scriptures together really simple question riddle me this if you will when is an orange a banana anybody when is an orange a banana well of course you're going to say never never <laughs> but there is at least one time when an orange becomes a banana you see if you peeled the grocery store barcode sticker off of a banana and stuck it on an orange and then took it to the checkout stand when they scan it then on that receipt it will say that that orange was indeed a banana because the barcode said banana now, it would be obvious to everyone there, if they were asked, that this orange is obviously not a banana. But nonetheless, when it passes the barcode test, it reads that it is a banana, right? That's the only time that an orange can be a, a banana is when the barcode sticker is wrong. So the orange is not a banana just because it has a banana barcode, though, right? You know that. In his book, The Divine Conspiracy, Dallas Willard writes about what he calls barcode religion or barcode Christianity, where uh, this popular brand of Christianity is just where we kind of take the sticker <laughs> and stick it on and say, we're Christian because of oh various reasons, because maybe we prayed a prayer once or we went to church or whatever, and we've got the barcode, and we say, well, that's good. I've got the barcode, and that's all. That's all. Barcodes are important. In fact, uh, I don't know, any of you shop at Aldi's? Aldi's is known for their efficiency and the way that they uh, get things done. And one of the problems with barcodes oftentimes is that they don't read the first time. So Aldi's has a solution to this. They actually put five, at least five barcodes on every product. They do. They do. You check it out next time you're there. Or in weird shaped uh, products like the oatmeal box you see there, they put a giant barcode that goes all the way around. And all that so that they can save time whenever the uh, person is checking you out. They can save time by getting that barcode. They got more barcodes or bigger barcodes. And sometimes as Christians, that's sort of what we do. If we feel insecure about our faith or we're not sure about it, hey, just get some more barcodes, right? <laughs> and so we've got the cross. We've got the T-shirt. Uh, we listen to the Christian radio. Uh, I clicked on like. On Facebook when it says if you love Jesus <laughs> click on if you and if you don't love Jesus don't click I clicked all right I got that going for me and then I even put the fish sticker on the car right you know this pastor Trent doesn't have one of those <laughs> you know, nobody wants to equate his driving with anything godly right <laughs> um, but the idea here is the same, that the more barcodes, if we can just get past the big checkout stand in the sky, you know, if we can have the right barcode, then you don't have to have any concern whether or not your behavior even remotely resembles the life of a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, because we've got the barcode, right? We are oranges with a barcode that says banana, right? Uh, we oftentimes go, think that that's all we're going to do. That's one of the concerns that drove uh, Trent and I and, and our staff to, to do this series called Get Her Done. Because we know that many people get introduced to Jesus Christ here. Many people pray prayers of decision to, to accept Jesus Christ into their life. And, and we've baptized so many and all of those things. But... It's very important that we go on with the mission of Jesus Christ because Jesus commanded the church, his disciples, not only to baptize new disciples, but to teach them to obey all things that Christ has commanded us. And so we're thinking, how do we 
really make disciples? How do we become disciples, and how do we make disciples in the church? And that's where we came up with this silly little title, Get Her Done, right? We want to know how do we get that work done of really becoming true disciples of Jesus. To review a little bit of last week, Trent talked about relationships, that if you're going to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, we need to follow his pattern. And Jesus' pattern when in relationships was is he had a relationship with crowds of people, you know, crowds of people oftentimes heard Jesus speak, but he never gave his whole heart to the crowd. He had a, a group within that, those crowds that, who were his 12, his disciples. Those were the, the posse that, that Trent talked about, the people that he, he took them aside and what he taught to the crowds, he explained in that small group. So that they can understand. Then he had within those 12, he had partners. He had two or three, Peter, James, and John specifically, that he, he gave special lessons to. He took them up on the Mount of Transfiguration and left the other nine down there, right? He, uh, he uh, took them in to see the little 12-year-old girl raised from the dead, and he didn't take the rest of them in. So those three had a special relationship with Jesus. Today, we're going to go to the next step in relationship and, and keeping with the uh, alliteration of uh, people, posse, partners, this is the person. <laughs> this is uh, the individual relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, the personal relationship you have with him. And, you know, Jesus had this too. I don't know that we, we don't want to talk too much about this because we don't like to think about Jesus having a BFF, you know. But Jesus had uh, a best friend. John chapter 21 verse 20 tells us about him. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. Now, guess who that was? It was John. And when you get to write your gospel, you get to tell them that you're the disciple that Jesus loved, right? <laughs> uh, isn't it amazing how Jesus can love crowds of people? He can love the whole world, but there's a sense in which he knows we know that he loves us. In that same little passage there, John 21, Jesus takes a walk with Peter. And remember, that, that's where this whole context of that thing, that conversation happens, right? Where he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And so we have these relationships of being part of a congregation, being part of a group of people. We have this small groups that we meet in to understand and, and grow together. We have partners, two or three people that we're accountable to and we listen to. But listen, there's a time when Jesus takes us on a one-on-one and those day, every day we have some time that we put, along, put, put with Jesus to really be his disciple and for him to lead and guide us. So disciples are individuals who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ too. How do we define disciple in these days? The word Christian has gotten applied in so many ways, it's actually become a very vague term. I don't, I don't, I don't know why, but it has. And these days, we, we're using much more biblical terms of disciple, which is mostly used in the Gospels. What is a disciple? Well, we can look to what Jesus said. He defines for us what a disciple is. In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus told the people who had faith in him, these are people who believed in him, who had faith in him. He says, if you keep on obeying what I have said, you are truly my disciples. You see that? If you keep on obeying what I have said, you are truly my disciples. And so what is a disciple? Someone who keeps on obeying what Jesus says. And I'm embarrassingly simple in these days. As I've gotten older, I've gotten more and more simple about things. But here's how simple it is. A disciple is someone who listens to Jesus and does what he says. Listen to Jesus, do what he says. You know, that makes life really, really simple, doesn't it? If you're going through, uh, you've got problems, you've got stuff going on in your life, and your, your spouse turns to you and goes, Honey, honey, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And say, Well, dear, I figure we ought to listen to Jesus and do what he says. Uh, things are going on in the church. We have a big board meeting. We're going to figure out what to do, you know, and we turn to Trent. We say, Trent, Trent, what do you think we ought to do? And Trent says, I think we should listen to Jesus and do what he says, right? You're teaching your children how to grow up and be, a, be Christians and follow Jesus. 
uh, they come to you with their problems, you say, you know what we ought to do? We ought to listen to Jesus and do what he says. Could it really be that simple to be a follower of Jesus Christ is to listen to him and do what he says? I think it is. In fact, Jesus is astounded when we don't do that. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he says to, to the, a, a crowd who's following him, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? <laughs> you're calling me Lord. You're, you've got the barcode, right? <laughs> but you're not doing what I say. It's that simple, right? Because Jesus is Lord. He's master. He's the one who has all authority. He tells the church our responsibility is to make other disciples. In Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, he tells us this. He says, Jesus came to them and said, listen, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has all authority. Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What is the purpose that we gather here, the purpose that we have as the church? It is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. And the method to do that, how do we get her done? Well, Jesus says, here's how you do it. You teach people to obey everything that I have commanded you. You teach people to obey everything that I've commanded you. Teach them to listen to me, Jesus says, and do what I said. Right? That's, it's that simple, and yet it's that hard sometimes, right? Listen to Jesus, do what he says. Do you notice how everything in Jesus' ministry, everything was rushing around to obey him? The demons, Jesus says, go, and they went. Right? The wind and the waves. Remember the disciples? He calmed the sea in the middle of the storm, you know. He said, hush, be still. And the sea got calm. And they said, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Everything around Jesus obeyed him. And here after his resurrection, he says, God has given me all authority in heaven and on earth. And so it only makes sense that we would be people who listen to Jesus and obey him and do what he says. In fact, Jesus says that's the wisest thing you could ever learn. In fact, if you do that, Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them in practice is like what? A wise man who built his house on the rock. The wisest thing you can do as you are building your life, as you are putting your life together, is to listen to Jesus' words and obey them. Because that's, that's where the security is of the solid rock. Now, what's the opposite of that? You know the other side of the story, don't you? And I love the message and its translation. It says, but if you just use my words in Bible studies... And don't work them into your life, that is, by obeying them, then you're like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in, the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. You see that? That's having barcode faith. That's barcode faith. And, and it doesn't get us through the storm. It doesn't get us through the hardships of life. In fact, Jesus, just to, just to put a lid on this, to put a, a top on it, to top it off, Jesus says, look, how are you going to show me that you love me? You know, he said, Peter, do you love me? He says, if you love me, obey my commandments. Listening to Jesus, doing what he says, is the way that we show our love to Christ. See, this is not about whether he loves you. He loves you. That's settled. <laughs> it's written in blood, you know. He settled that a long time ago. He's forgiven all your sins. He's come to make your life complete. He's done everything. He gave his whole heart, his whole life for you, for me. The love of Christ is settled in eternity, right? It's settled for you. Here's the question we're still trying to live out every day. Do we love him enough to listen to him and do what he says? Well, that's really important, isn't it? And that's how we get it done as disciples of Jesus. That's how we get it done. So we said, what is a disciple? Someone who listens to Jesus 
and do what he says. So how are we going to do this? Say it with me. Listen to Jesus, do what he says. Listen to Jesus, do what he says. That's what we're going to learn to do. There's almost a, a rhythm in the disciples' life. I mean, after all, Jesus said, follow me, right? And the rhythm of our life is listen to Jesus, do what he says. You know, just step by step following him. In our discipleship process that we worked on here at the church, we really put four stages to it, that we need to listen to Jesus, we need to understand what he says, of course we need to understand before we can do anything about it, right? Listen to Jesus, understand what he says, then we need to obey it, we need to do it, work it into our lives and do something about it, right? And then we need to share it with others, because part of what Jesus he said if, uh, about uh, making disciples that you teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, including the command to make disciples, right? So we have to share that with others. When that gets very practical in our lives, we're getting down to the get or done stage, right? It's really about listening to Jesus' word. Listening to his word and then responding to it by obeying listening to his word, and then obeying. Now, how do we hear Jesus' word? Well, now, there's some people who say they hear Jesus' word all the time. They hear voices and all that kind of stuff. That's all possible. We'll, we'll, you know, if, that, if, that, if you've got that gift, that's wonderful. <laughs> but the truth is, we need something a little more concrete than that. And what we do have is we have the Bible. We have the Bible. The Bible has recorded for us the words of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the teachings of the church, uh, the Old Testament before that. We have that all before us. What are we going to do with the Bible? Now, I think that we, oftentimes we find that troubling these days because the Bible seems so intimidating to us. And uh, oftentimes we just choose to ignore it. I'm just going to go to church, show up in the Bible studies and those kind of things, and whoever, you know, other people can handle this book for me. You know what I'm saying? But remember, this is the individual part of being a disciple, and at some point you've got to engage, you've got to engage the Word of God in the book, you know, in order to be able to follow Jesus. Many people choose to ignore it. Some try to replace it with something else, uh, with with devotional things, and those aren't bad, but to tell you the truth, most devotional readings are meant to make you feel good. They're to give you that little start, like a cup of coffee in the morning, or <laughs> give you something to kind of like, ah, oh, now I feel inspired for the day, you know, and that's not the same as listening to Jesus and doing what he says, all right? Not bad, but just not the same as that. And oftentimes, the scriptures can be misused. You know, the Pharisees were experts at the scripture, but they misused it. In fact, Jesus had to say to them, you diligently study the scriptures, and by doing so, you think you have life, and yet you refuse to come to me so that you can have life. See, the purpose of the scriptures is to lead us to become followers of Jesus Christ. That's, that's it. The purpose of the scripture is to lead us to become followers of Jesus Christ by hearing his word and doing what he says. So how do we get at this big old book? <laughs> you know, it's actually not just a book. It's a library. It's 66 books put together. How do we even begin? Well, Jesus didn't say, go and make Bible scholars. He, he really didn't say that. <laughs> and I say that as someone who spent a lot of money and time on formal Christian education. But the truth is, is that that's not what Jesus called us to become or to make of others is Bible scholars. If people want to become experts in, in studying the scriptures and that's their calling, then, then that's great. But for most of us, you and me, the calling is to become disciples of Jesus who hear what he says and do what he says. He said, go and make disciples. That's the goal. The goal is not to be able to win at Bible trivia. I know. I was in one church one time, and I met this guy, and his life was a mess. His relationships were a mess. His kids, his kids didn't think much of him, and he had been through several uh, broken relationships. 
and yet uh, he wanted to challenge every pastor on staff to play Bible trivia. That was his thing, you know, he wanted to do that. You see the problem with that? Bible trivia is not where we're at. We want to get to a place where we allow the words of Jesus to shape our lives, to represent, so that we can represent his rule or his kingdom in this world. God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. See, that's what's happening when you listen to Jesus and do what he says. God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. And you have a whole lifetime to do that, so chill out, all right? You don't have to understand all the Bible right now. You're not in a program where four years you have to know it all to get a degree or something. You have a whole lifetime to take the scriptures and, and learn how to follow Jesus through them. So how do we start? We start day by day and approaching the scriptures in a simple kind of way. Don't start with a chapter. Frankly, a chapter is too big. It's too big for just listening to Jesus and doing what he says. Because in any chapter, you're going to have a whole handful of commandments, right? You're going to have a whole lot of things, you know? Just imagine some of the riches that are found in uh, one chapter of the Bible. Just, just think of one, you know? Uh, Matthew 13 has, oh, I don't know, I think four or five different parables of Jesus. So, listen, don't, a chapter's too big. Uh, don't start with a verse, because a verse is too small. You know what I think we do in the, in, in the church? We have a bad case of what I would call versitis, all right? <laughs> because we have divided the Bible into verses, these little snippets, these little verses that have the numbers in front of them. We have a verse for every problem, and do you know what that does to the Bible? It kind of turns it into a reference book, sort of like a dictionary. Oh, I'm going to find out what that means, you know, and you flip it up. When's the last time you spent a good devotional time in the morning with a dictionary? Not lately, huh? That's what we do to the Bible sometimes when we do that. Uh, or else, we, again, we go to the Bible for inspiration, and we, we pull these verses out, and we're like, oh, that makes me feel so, you know, and that's great, that's great, but the Bible is not a deck of Hallmark cards either. <laughs> Sometimes uh, people have taken all, all kinds of, made all kinds of schemes of doctrines and interpretations uh, as if the Bible was a big jigsaw puzzle. And each jigsaw puzzle piece is a verse of the Bible. And we dump the, all the pieces out, we put them together, and we make this big picture. But here's the problem. It doesn't look like the picture on the box when we get done. Because the picture on the box looks like Jesus. And we've come out with this whole other thing, right? And we say, well, it's biblical because it's made up of all these verses. But it, it's, it doesn't look, it doesn't make us like Jesus. Listen, simple thing when it talks about, I'm talking about versitis. Is, do you realize that the early church, it wasn't until modern times that we actually had chapters and verses delineated in the Bible? <laughs> they didn't even have that. They didn't even have chapters and verses. So none of those are original parts of the scriptures. And so we've made so much of them. But what they did have, what they always had, was what we might call a paragraph. What they really had were stories, episodes. And the cool thing is, is that in most of your modern Bibles today, you have headings that tell you, here's a certain story. And so you know that here's a section. And, and you can tell that. You can tell when, when the story ends and it goes to something else, right? So you have an episode or a story. Now, that's what we want to, to deal with. When we talk about listening to Jesus and do what he says, we want to deal with one episode or one story or one section that has a heading in your Bible, okay? Okay. And whether you're using a Bible like this or you're using your phone with the U version or whatever, use those kinds of things to help you to uh, get to a, a small section of Scripture that deals with one episode or one story. And 
if we're going, if we're really focusing, you got your whole life to study the Bible, but your real focus is to listen to Jesus and do what he says, then where are you going to start? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? Because the only Jesus we know about are, is the stories that we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Uh, so that's where we start. We start with the Gospels. We start with the Gospels. Now, how then, Pastor Mark, how do we begin to really get at a scripture and listen to Jesus and do what he says? That's your purpose now, okay? Your purpose is to listen to Jesus and do what he says. You got a small section of scripture. I want to give you a real simple way to try to get at it, and it's by asking questions of understanding. Now, these are not like questions of biblical archaeology. These are not questions uh, about the, the uh, background of certain texts of the Bible. All that stuff are what the professionals and the experts do. These are questions to ask so that you can understand what's going on in a passage. And they're embarrassingly simple again. Okay, they're real simple, real simple. The first question you want to ask is, after reading the story, what does this story say about people? How people are what do we how do how are people what do people do what do they do uh if you come into scripture where it says everybody says then you're going to say oh that's something about people people are like this what does it tell you about how people are in general humanity how are we what are we about look at that okay then the second thing you want to ask is what does this story say about jesus i'm assuming we're in the gospels now okay because you want to see, what does this story tell me about Jesus? What does Jesus do? What does Jesus say? What is Jesus' uh, actions? What's his, his uh, posture, his stance towards people? How does he deal with That's how we're getting to know him. We're getting to see what does the Bible actually say about who Jesus is, right? So we're learning about what Jesus, who Jesus is. So what does it say about people? What does it say about Jesus? Now, here's the key question, and where it gets very, very personal, is what is this story saying to you? What's it saying to you? And this is where the Holy Spirit is obviously involved here, revealing Christ to us and speaking to us. Because you should come away from any story, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you should come away from any story with a with an understanding that there's something that God is trying to say to me here. There's something that Jesus wants me to know or Jesus wants me to do. What is that thing? What is it? Stick with that question until you get a good answer to it and then go do, then be prepared that day to do what he tells you to do, right? Jesus talks about love your enemy, right? So you say, how am I going to do that? Who's my enemy? Okay, you see how you're working through that? And then finally, we get in a bad habit in, in the church as Christians sometimes of, of receiving from God without giving to others. You never want to receive anything from God that you're not passing on to others. You're being made a disciple, but you're also called to make disciples. So who do you know who needs to hear this story? Who do you know who needs to hear this story? Now, this is different from trying to get somebody to change their life or trying to get someone to reform their behavior or, or even trying to get somebody saved. This is like reading a story and saying, man, I read this story this morning where Jesus took, he spit on the ground, he made mud, he put on this blind guy's eyes, and then he told him to go wash his eyes. He could see. You can tell a story like that without, without uh, being threatening or anything to anybody. It's just it's like taking what you've learned, what you've experienced, and just sharing it with somebody else. So what does it say about people? What's it say about Jesus? What's it say to you? And then who do you know who needs to hear? Now, this is really simple. I'll give you an easy way to remember this, okay? This is a simple way to remember it. There it is. You see it? See, I had, a, I had a children's pastor tell me this when I shared this one. I was teaching this one time, and he said, oh, yeah, this is easy because I work with kids. People, P, Jesus, J, and you Kids love peanut butter and jelly and you right? <laughs> so this is it, P, J, U, who? Peanut butter, jelly, you all right? There's your four questions. You sit with the Bible, you find a story, 
and you ask yourself these questions. What is this story teaching me about people? What's this story te teaching me about Jesus? What is it saying to you? What is it saying to me right now? And who do I know needs to hear that story? Now, that's really, really simple, right? A simple way to get at Scripture. And it's not about making you a Bible scholar. It's not about getting you to be able to win Bible quizzing championships or whatever. It's about coming away from the Scriptures every day, here listening to Jesus, and then going out to do what he says, which is the rhythm of discipleship. Listening to Jesus, do what he says. Listening to Jesus, do what he says. It becomes a rhythm. And over time, it can become almost like breathing. Listening to Jesus, do what he says. Let's try this real quick. John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Here's a quick story. You know the story, but I'm going to read it to you, okay? On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you to do. Nearby stood six stone water jars, and the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned to wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he told the bride, took the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, listening to that story, what does that story tell us about people? You can think of some answers. Like one of the ones that I thought is like, oh, okay, well, people have weddings. People have weddings. When they have weddings, whenever there's a wedding, it's a big deal. In fact, I get most nervous when I get involved in somebody's wedding because a wedding represents people's dreams, <laughs> especially young ladies. It represents their dreams. It represents their plans. It's a big event, and it's for the future, and people have these kind of things. Uh, what happens, though, in the midst of all of these dreams and plans and things that we look forward to in our lives, what often happens is that people run out of the good stuff before their dreams, their plans are finished, they run out. And people usually try to compensate when that happens uh, by some kind of cheap substitute, <laughs> right? Everybody brings out the, has the good stuff and then they bring out the cheap stuff, right? So what does this story tell us about Jesus then? Well, Jesus shows up in our lives when we invite him. Can you imagine that? Jesus and his disciples are at the wedding. Why are they there? Somebody invited him. So Jesus shows up in our lives when we invite him. Jesus has his own plans. Do you notice that? Jesus' mother says they're out of wine, and he says it's not my time yet, right? Jesus has his own plans. God has his own plans. He has his purposes. But listen, Jesus can be persuaded to get involved in our problems, our lack, and our loss if we ask him. It's one of the funny things of the story when, when Mary says to Jesus, uh, go ahead, do what he says, did it, right? So that happens. And then Jesus uses the ordinary things of this life to work in the midst of our lives. He takes water jars that were used for ceremonial cleansing. They washed themselves in them, fills them up with plain old water, and then turned in and, and then... Uh, Turns them in there. That means that Jesus works with, well, not with what we don't have, but with what we do have, right? And when Jesus is invited and gets involved, miraculous things happen. All of a sudden, what we lacked is now filled up with Jesus' abundance, right? These jars, these jars, there were six of them, 20 to 30 gallons each. That meant that they went from zero wine 
to over 120 to 180 gallons of wine, all out of ordinary things, ordinary water jars. I always get the picture today that Jesus was at, at our house or at our wedding or our, our, our event. He would probably say, fill up the tub with water, fill up the bathtub with water and watch what I do with it. Jesus then reveals himself to others and people come to believe in him. That's what it says about people. That's what it says about Jesus. But what's this story saying to you? What's it saying to you? Well, this is pretty simple. Jesus' mother kind of puts it real square. Right in the middle of the story is a simple little, little sentence. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do you realize that Jesus, with all of his power, could not have performed this miracle if someone hadn't listened to him and did what he said. Fill the jars up with water. Take some of it to the host of the banquet. Do you see that? What is this saying to you? What's it saying to me this morning? When we listen to Jesus and do what he says, we open the way for his miraculous work to take place right in the middle of our lives. And just like with the water and the wine that's turned into wine, everybody gets a taste of what Jesus does. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Our obedience to Jesus, our discipleship, brings the miraculous work of Jesus into our world. And when he does, what he does uh, offers others a chance to see his glory and come to believe in him now who do you know that needs to hear this story who do you know let's take a moment and think about that as Trent comes to close for us and that's a simple way to get her done in listening to the Jesus and doing what he says by using the scriptures